Tuesday drive to church. Bam, bam. Oh, forgot to put it in drive. Bam. Bam. <laughs> well, uh, I'm taking a break, by the way. So, I, I, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry it's been a while, but I'm still on sort of a until Christmas hiatus. But I can't help myself because it's St. Michael's Day today, which is such a glorious day. Such a fantastic day. It's required of everyone, all you guys, YouTube theologians out there, to go and read Revelation chapter 12. One of the highlights of the Bible. We'll talk about it now. And I just got back from Fort Wayne. I'm feeling a lot better, by the way. So thanks, everyone, for your prayers. And I'm a little bit chomping at the bit to get back to some of this teaching. But I still think it's probably wise to wait. So still, you're not going to hear too much from me in the next few months, but maybe a little bit more. Uh, but I, I got to go to Fort Wayne last week uh, and uh, visit and meet a few people. And I got an email from a gentleman that I met there. And he was asking me, his wife uh, had COVID and had some of the same things that I had kind of coming afterwards, some neurological sort of things, uh, lost uh, lost herself a little bit, like I lost myself a little bit. And so he was asking for some advice on that. And I want to weave that question together a little bit with St. Michael, because whenever we talk about the angels, which are all around us, uh, protecting us and keeping us, we there's a, always a danger of, of leaning one way or another. Number one, that we forget about them or on the other side that we become obsessed with them. We, we forget that the devil is a roaring lion seeking for whom he is to devour. So that's the danger on the one side is the forgetfulness or the uh, lack of awareness, a, a secular rather than a spiritual set of eyes. And the other danger is that we forget that the promises, that we stand firm, that we resist him and he flees from us. This is what a marvelous promise, that the devil flees from us. And so that's why, so, so when it comes to things like mm, COVID, I suppose when it comes to anything that reminds us of our own mortality, it's a good barometer, it's a good, it's a good sort of, it's a good spiritual temperature check to just say, how is my fear? Now, it's one thing to recognize your fears, and then it's another thing altogether to do something about them. But the first step is to recognize them. What am I afraid of? That's our, that's our diagnostic question when it comes to the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So we say, what am I afraid of? What am I in love with? What do I trust in? What do I look to for all good? Who do I cry out to help for when things are bad? But what, it, what am I afraid of? And we should recognize that we are born into a fear of death, that every single one of us is afraid to die. You were born with a fear of death in your mind and your heart and your conscience. But the scripture tells us that that fear of death is bondage to the devil. Now, this is a hard spiritual truth because we want, we, we're always trying to tell ourselves that it's okay to be afraid to die. Everyone's afraid to die. Death, after all, is the enemy. We're not supposed to want to die. When the Lord was trying to talk us out of eating the fruit in the garden, he says, on the day you eat of it, you will die. In other words, the fear of death was supposed to be motivation for the good works of, of Adam and Eve. And so we're always trying to tell ourselves that it's okay to be afraid to die. Or, or this, we do this thing, uh, this little trick. We should say, well, I'm not afraid to die. I'm just afraid of dying. <laughs> I'm afraid of everything. That, I'm not afraid of the moment of death. I'm just afraid of all the stuff that leads up to it. Okay, same thing. <laughs> and Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 2, 14, 15, etc. says that Jesus took on flesh and blood so that through his death, he might destroy him who has the power of the devil and set all of those who were held in bondage their whole lives through the fear of death, that he would set them free. That's not actually how it says it. That's my paraphrase, but for COVID brain, I can't remember. So that, so that, that the, the fear of death is bondage to the devil. Now, to diagnose it is one thing. To do something about it is something, something altogether different. Because we cannot set ourselves free from the fear of death. We cannot set ourselves free from the fear of dying. We cannot set ourselves free from our bondage to the devil, just as little as we can set ourselves free to our bondage to sin. The Lord has to do it. 
So you can recognize, we ought to be able to recognize in ourselves the fear of death. There's death and I'm afraid. You know, we ought to be able to recognize it. So for example, if in the COVID thing now, this is where this comes in. We have this panic that uh, I can, I'm gonna go out in the world and I'm gonna get the COVID and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna die or cough for the rest of my life or whatever. Uh, and we're afraid of that, afraid of the sickness. So we can diagnose it and we can confess it. That's about as far as we can get on our own. We can say, Lord, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of getting sick. I'm afraid of being exposed. I'm afraid of dying, etc. We can confess it. But it's up to the Lord to set us free from it. And how does he do it? He does it through the gospel. This is The gospel, remember, is spiritual warfare. The gospel is casting the devil out. And we see a picture of it in Revelation 12. Now, this is how Revelation 12 starts. It's, it's, the, it's the pinnacle vision of the whole vision of Revelation. If, if you want to, like, a hint to reading Revelation, you just got to remember that it's an apocalypse. It's an unveiling. It's the, the Lord gives John spiritual eyes to see all the terrible things happening on earth, all the demonic activity, the rivers and the beasts and the whore and the, and the dragon and all the blood and the, and the trumpets and everything. It's like the spiritual reality of how bad things are on earth. And just when John is about convinced by this sight that, that this world belongs to the devil, then the Lord takes him up to get a peek in the throne of heaven. And so John will, time after time, three or four times in the book of Revelation, he'll be, he'll be brought up to heaven and he'll get a glimpse of the throne room to see who's sitting there. Who's in charge of this whole mess? And the one who sits on the throne is the Lamb of God. Now that's the chief thing. If, you, if, if, you, if nothing from anything else I said, nothing from this video that you don't pick up on, this is the main thing that, that the Lamb of God sits on the throne. The devil might be the prince of this world, but Jesus is the king. The devil might be the prince of the power of the air, but Jesus is the king of king and lord of lords. He sits on the throne right now. You can't see it. This is the point. You can't see it. That's why it has to be revealed from heaven and in the word. Okay, so here's Revelation 12. It said, John says, I saw a vision uh, and there was a woman who was with child and she has, she's crowned with stars. This is the vision. It's, uh, it's Israel. This is a vision of the whole Old Testament. Genesis 3.15 tells us that the seed of the woman will destroy, will crush the head of the serpent, even as his own heel is crushed. And from that moment on, Old Testament, the Old Testament people of God are like a woman expecting a child. In fact, remember Eve thought that her, her first son was the, the Lord. I have begotten a man who is the Lord, Cain. Uh, she was wrong about that. Cain was not the Lord, not yet. It's generations later, but this is the picture of the pregnant woman and it comes down to Mary. So Mary at last is this promise fulfilled. Here's Israel with child and the child is born. In fact, it says, okay, here's the woman in Revelation 12 waiting to get, laboring to give birth. And I saw another sign in heaven, a great fiery red dragon waiting to devour the child as soon as the child was born. In fact, if you, if you want a beautiful, I mean, it's a horrible, but wonderful, maybe that's the right word. If you want a wonderful picture of all the troubles of the people of God in the Old Testament, I mean, the rod of the Pharaohs and the, and the wars from the Assyrians and all the strife. And, I mean, remember how Pharaoh was trying to kill all the babies in Egypt? And so Moses had to float down the Nile in a basket, all this trouble. Even Herod trying to kill, killing the babies in Bethlehem, trying to get to Jesus. That's the dragon trying to devour the child. So the devil pressed Israel hard because he was after this promised Messiah. Well, Revelation in one verse has the birth, life, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus all in one little phrase. It says, the child was born and he was caught up into heaven. The child who's to rule the to rule the nations with the rod of iron. So that one verse covers the covers the whole life, death, and ascension of Jesus. It's beautiful. 
And something then happens. Now here's the main point. When Jesus is caught up into heaven, a war breaks out. Now we would think that this world is the place where there's wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations. You would think if there's any place where there's not going to be any war, it's in heaven. But Revelation corrects on this. I mean, if there's something that the book of Revelation does is it shows us that there's a lot of things happening in heaven that you wouldn't expect. Remember John is weeping in heaven? You don't expect tears to be in heaven, but there's certainly don't expect a war to be in heaven. But why is there a war in heaven? Because it turns out that in the throne room of God, there's a seat for the devil. The, the picture of the throne room of God or the council of God is this chamber room and here's at the middle is the throne of God but there's other seats all around it where the where the the angels can come and sit and so you remember for example in Job chapter 1 when the Lord assembles all the angels to come and take their place and who comes to sit there is the devil who's got a chair in heaven and what does he do well that's the chair is marked Satan which means accuser so that he goes to the court to 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 lie and deceive but most especially to accuse that's how it says it in Revelation 12 the accuser of our brethren who accused them day and night before the throne of God. That's how the devil is described. The ancient serpent, the dragon of old, and so forth. The accuser of the brethren who accused them day and night. So just like the devil did with Job, so he does with all of the Lord's people. He sits there and brings accusation. And he doesn't need to lie because we've got plenty of evidence against us. We've got plenty of sin. We've got plenty of guilt. So the devil comes and accuses and accuses us of all of our sins. But but here's wh- where the war breaks out. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, he ascends into heaven and he brings into heaven the victory of his death and resurrection. He brings before the courtroom of God the evidence of his atoning work. Hebrews talks about how Jesus carried his own blood into heaven. So remember in the Old Testament how the high priest on the Day of Atonement would take the blood of the sacrifice and bring it into the mercy seat and put it on the horns of the mercy seat? Well, Jesus does that, but he doesn't take the blood of bulls and goats. He takes his own blood, and he doesn't go into the temple in Jerusalem. He goes into the heavenly tabernacle, and he presents his blood not on the, on the mercy seat, but before the true throne of God. He brings his blood into this throne room, his forgiving and atoning blood, and now there's nothing to accuse. <laughs> what, what, what is the devil going to accuse that Jesus has not forgiven? What evidence is the devil going to bring before the throne of God that Jesus has not died for? Can you imagine the throne room? The, the, here's the court case in heaven. Uh, Your Honor, here the devil says, Your Honor, I don't know if that's what he calls God. Your Honor, here's, uh, here's Brian's sin. Here's the thing that he did yesterday. Here's the thing that he thought. Here's the love that he failed to do. Here's whatever, you know. And, uh, and it's true. I mean, I've got plenty of sins. And But there, Jesus says, uh, objection? That sin is died for. Sustained. Oh, the devil says, well, don't, don't worry. I got another one. Here's another sin. And, and Jesus says, objection? I, that sin is atoned for. Oh, don't worry, I got more. And the devil keeps bringing this in one after another. Objection. Jesus says, objection. My blood, objection. My suffering, objection. The cross, objection. My work, objection. My my suffering and death, objection. Jesus objects to all of these accusations and and all of them are sustained. All of them stand. The, The blood of Jesus stands as the testimony, not of our, not not of our holiness, but of his redemption. Not of our goodness, but of his mercy. Not of our perfection, but of his holiness, his, his, his suffering, his victory over the cross. His blood stands. And when the blood of Jesus stands in heaven, there's now no more accusations, no more condemnations that the devil can bring. There's no place for him in heaven anymore. And so, this is where St. Michael comes in. Jesus calls forth St. Michael like the bailiff of the heavenly courtroom and says, Could you remove him? Jesus doesn't even do it himself. <laughs> I mean, he could, and you've got to think that that would have been fun for him. But 
But what a great gift of God's grace that he says that now, because of his victory on the cross, even St. Michael can remove this strongest of archangels, the devil himself. <laughs> it's like sending in the B team. I remember in high school, we had a really good basketball team. I wasn't on it. One of the reasons why it was good, I suppose. And uh, we would just be cleaning people's clocks. And so the coach would send in the B team just to make it so it wasn't such a... That's like, that's like St. Michael. The, Jesus sends in the B team to show how his, he's really beating the devil. I mean, he doesn't even have to remove him himself. Okay, so war breaks out on heaven. Back to Revelation 12. War breaks out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And they did not prevail. The devil did not win. He wanted to keep his place, but he couldn't. The victory of Jesus stands. And so he was swept out of heaven and he was cast down. It says, the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before the throne of God day and night, was cast down to earth. He, the devil, because of the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, the devil no longer has any place to accuse you before the throne of God. Can you imagine it? Now, this is the reason why death is so scary. Hebrew says it's appointed for man to die once and then to be judged, but not you. You've passed from death to life. There is no condemnation before, uh, uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Uh, John, Jesus says in John chapter 5 that we will not be judged. There's no judgment for the Christian. The judgment happened when Jesus died on the cross. There, I mean, if there's a judgment for you after death, it's this. Welcome, good and faithful servant. Not because we are good and because we are faithful, but because everything we've done wrong is forgiven. We're holy by forgiveness. We're perfect by his redemption. We, we are, we are uh, righteous because of the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. And so that we, that we will not come into judgment. We're welcome. There's nothing that there's nothing to accuse that has not been forgiven. Can you imagine that? That the, the that you are as welcome in heaven. You are as welcome before the face of God in the resurrection as Jesus himself is welcome. Do you wonder if you're going to get into heaven? Do you, did you think Jesus wondered at how it was going to be when he died and 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 then rose and then went to went to heaven. Do, do you think that he was wondering if God was now going to let him in? No. And you don't. The same is for you because you have His righteousness. How does Paul say it? Like this: 2 Corinthians chapter five, that He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. The righteousness of God is what you have. You are, by faith, as perfect as Jesus is. Now, that's stunning. You can only believe it by faith. Only the Holy Spirit can give us the faith to believe that kind of promise. It's just too good, because you know your sin. But you, dear Christian, are as perfect as Jesus. You are as righteous as God by faith. Not by your works, but by faith. That's what Jesus has given to you. That's, what, that's the important thing about justification, right? It's not just the taking away of everything we've done bad. It's the giving everything Jesus did right. The imputation of the righteousness of Christ. So there's nothing to accuse you before the throne of God in heaven. There's no place for the devil anymore. He was cast down from heaven to earth. But Revelation tells us the rest of the story. So happy St. Michael's Day, by the way. That's glorious. But it, it tells us that the devil comes down and he's full of rage because he knows his time is short. And he knows he doesn't have a place to accuse us before God the Father in heaven. So what does he do? He comes to accuse us in our own conscience. He has no standing before the face of God. So he tries to come and lie and deceive in our own hearts. He comes into the courtroom of your conscience and there he accuses you. Look at what you've done wrong. Look at your sin. Look at all of this sort of stuff. And he tries to make us afraid of dying. Then he has us in bondage. I don't wonder if the whole panic over COVID, I mean, look, it's a bad disease. Okay. It's not like we've never faced bad diseases in the history of the world. Did we think that we had that we had somehow evolved past the idea of a plague? Did we think 
because of our great scientific technological advances that we now, we great people, we're never going to have to be humbled by a, by a disease again? Is that what we thought? Is that why we're panicked? It's not like humanity's never faced a plague before. Goodness. But now we got this great COVID. And do you wonder that if our panic and our great fear over this disease is because we've forgotten that we have to die? You have to die. I have to die. It's not, that's not, it doesn't take the Holy Spirit to figure that out. You just got to look around a little bit. We got to die, but we shouldn't be afraid of it. Anyway, the devil wants us afraid, so he comes down to our own conscience and he accuses us. And, but, but here's what the text says, Revelation 12. It says, they overcame him by three things or two things and a third. The devil came down to give us all sorts of trouble, to try to bring his lying and accusing ways to us. But it says they overcame him by the word of their testimony and by the blood of, their lamb, by the, blood of the lamb, and they did not love their lives unto death. So that, so that the word of God and the blood of Jesus does the same work in your heart that St. Michael does in heaven. The blood of Jesus, the word of the gospel, and our not fearing death casts the devil out of our conscience and out of our hearts. So, so we can diagnose our own fear, but what's the solution? The Word of God. What's the solution? The blood of Jesus, the Lord's Supper. These, these things give us the, the, the spiritual strength and authority to know that the Lord is good. <laughs> That he keeps his promises. That he forgives our sins. Which means that one day, one day you will have the privilege, just like today, you have the privilege of, of, of living in the Lord's name. One day you'll have the privilege of dying in the Lord's name. And he'll, and he'll welcome you to his throne where you have a seat. And you'll join with Michael and Gabriel and all the angels singing holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth. May God grant us this the courage of His truth that there's no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, happy St. Michael's Day. 